can't hear. Oh, okay. Can you hear now? Oh. Um, well, I'll start again then. It's my pleasure to introduce a very distinguished panel. Moni Mohsen, journalist, columnist, author of three novels, two of which are based on her immensely popular column, The Diary of a Social Butterfly. Uh, Shehan Karuna Latika, author of uh, Chinaman, Matthew, winner of the DSC Award of Fiction, and, and also the Commonwealth Book Prize. Uh, prior to that, he used to be a copywriter and advertising man. Well, actually, I think he still is. Um, Jeet Thail, poet, English author of collections and libretto. Recent winner of the 2013 DSC Award for Salvation Literature. <laughs> for his novel Narcopolis. And he's also shortlisted for the uh, Man Booker Award and the Man Asia Award. <laughs> Nadi Maslam, author of four novels and a novella. <laughs> including The Blind Man's Garden, which was launched yesterday. And he is the recipient of a Betty Trask Award, the Kiriyama Award, and has been shortlisted for the Dublin Pack Award, among others. So what we're going to talk about this morning is um, Commonwealth, Globalism, Nationalism, that was the subtitle, um, Storytelling and Language in the 21st Century. What the basic idea behind it is that for a very long time, until about uh, three decades ago in fact, the um, definition of English literature was the literature of England and America. Then it, uh, they began a course and became a realization that some of the best English language writing was actually coming from um, migrant literature, from um, black American literature, from uh, countries that had been Britain's erstwhile colonies. So the question we're going to look at is what's the relationship between the writer and nation and the wider Anglophone world and his readership in both? How does this influence the process of storytelling in a global age. So the first question that I'm going to put to the panel, which um, is what challenges does English prose as a creative language, as a colonial legacy, and as well as the dominant language of the global world? And how do you create a narrative that speaks to international audience and to one in South Asia? So we'll begin in turn, I think, Moni. Um, I um, was educated at um, school by missionaries, so the medium of instruction was English. Um, I was born long after colonialism ended. So for me, the language was never one of my colonial masters. It was just the language in which I grew up. Um, I spoke Urdu at home, and I spoke English at school and I learned to write in English. Um, so I have continued writing in English. And I find sometimes um, this um, slight, kind of disturbing, or slightly exercising when I'm asked continuously, it's for me, I find that if I write in English, I have a wider audience in the world. I can speak to people in South Africa, I can speak to people in Canada, I can speak to people in Australia, I can speak to people in Egypt, I can speak to people in Nigeria if I write in English. And why wouldn't I want to have as broad um, an audience as I could? Um, when you play, for example, when there's a, a cricket team, it doesn't just play at home, it plays all over the world. And there is, there is potential for my growth, there is potential also for me to go and tell my stories about my country outside 
the world. And sometimes, Nadeem and I were discussing this earlier today, that sometimes this charge is levied at you, that you are telling stories for a Western audience. It is the same book. It is the same book. It does not have versions of uh, a Western version and a Pakistani version. The Diary of Social Butterfly was written here. It was read here for many years before it was taken abroad. Um, so level a charge at it that you're writing now for a Western audience is, I think, misplaced. Uh, I enjoy writing in English. I enjoy writing, as I said, for a wider audience. I also write because I can then talk to people like Jeet and I can talk to people like Shahan, which I couldn't if I just wrote in Urdu. Um, the other thing is that um, I don't wish, I mean, I want to pass the mic on to somebody else, but the English that, that I um, write is not the Queen's English. Um, the butterfly does not speak the Queen's English. Mm -hmm. The butterfly speaks her own language. The butterfly speaks Pakistani English, actually Lahari English. And I'm very proud of that, that she does, that we have taken ownership of this, what was once a colonial language, taken ownership of it and made it our own language. It is, and in fact, when we take it to England and show it to them, show them the possibilities of their own language, how it has changed, how it has adapted, and how it has grown. Um, you got to understand that, uh, like, my experience of this is um, a sample size of all of one book, which, uh, when I was writing Chinaman, um, I, I certainly wasn't thinking of international audience because I didn't think that was possible uh, for a, a Sri Lankan writer writing in English. And um, there, there are a lot of Sri Lankan writers who uh, are based uh, abroad, a lot of distinguished, accomplished writers who write about Sri Lanka, but it's always about a story of returning back, and it's always an outsider view. And some, some of these stories, um, when you talk about it in, in Colombo among Sri Lankan readers, they say that certain aspect, I mean, it can be something as simple as a tri as auto rickshaw, which would, would happen in Sri Lanka. Uh, for me, it was more important that Sri Lankan readers um, found the, the story and the prose authentic. So I was, I think the challenge with English is when you're writing about um, actors who think and speak in, say, Sinhalese or Tamil, and how you, what type of language you use to paraphrase those thoughts, and the fact that uh, you can't use certain words and you can't even drop in certain Western pop culture references in there. So you've got to adopt a different persona. I think with Chinaman it was uh, I'm fortunate in that the characters themselves were speaking in English. They, uh, <coughs> they, it was an atmosphere where that's what they would communicate, but it would be their, their own brand of, um, of Sri Lankan English. And that I found quite easy because that was just, if you live in, in Sri Lanka and you just talk to people, you get the rhythms of that. Uh, that language, and for me, that was more important. Getting that voice authentic. Um, in Undachi's book, um, Anil's Goat, he talked about um, how when there's a Hollywood movie about going to some fractured part of the world. They always tend to end the same way. They end with the the journalist or the activist or the soldier in a plane or a helicopter flying out, and uh, and there's a swelling music and perhaps there's voiceover, and it's uh, He's looking down at this mess that he left, and he, he hasn't solved it, but of course he or she leaves as a better, uh, more rounded person, enriched by that experience. But the thing is, I was I thought there's opportunity. I mean, um, I think that's that's all fine. But I'm more interested to the guy on the ground who's waving at the plane. Um, so rather than this this west, I mean. At least we've moved on from the John Wayne approach of coming in and civilizing the native and uh, going out. Um, you realize <coughs> you, can't pr you can't solve these problems. Um, so, you, um, so you leave uh, with some, uh, this guy leaving with some epiphany. But I was more interested in the guy who's on the ground, his interpreter, who's living at the plane, and who's stuck in this shithole, and he, he has no helicopter to take him out. And it seemed that rather than someone who comes in and goes out with a changed view, that guy who's stuck there, that seemed to be the story worth telling. And um, so therefore, I, I guess I, I wasn't thinking of how I would represent it to an international audience, but just within the country being authentic. I think uh, this question of writing for an audience, um, uh, the 
best way to answer it is to read a little passage from my book. Uh, you know, there was a time when if you used a, a word that doesn't occur in English, you would have a glossary. Well, these days we have Google. And even if you don't use Google, uh, there may be some of you who don't uh, know the word that occurs frequently in this passage I'm about to read. Uh, but I think you can make a fairly accurate guess as to what it means. And if not, you can ask me later. This country, cunt country, how the fuck are you supposed to live here without drugs? Look at the Gujaratis, chutes. We all know this, came to chutyas, human calculators. You can't even talk to them without giving them cash. Such accomplished chutes. And the Kashmiris, complete chute. Offer them your hand, they'll take your ass. It's their nature, they can't help it. And what about the Madrasis, all those Keralites and Kanadigas and so on? Chutes. Undu Gundu Chutyas. Idli Dosa Chutyas. Nothing personal, but it's true. You know it, and I know it. And Punjabis. Do I even have to mention Punjabis? <laughs> Number one chutes, the Punjus. They'll eat, they'll eat and drink with you, and all the while they're measuring you for a coffin. Bengalis? Bengalis are beyond your average category of chutiadam. They are chutes of the highest order, first quality bodrolok chutios, who invent new levels of chutianess daily, followed closely, as in everything, by the Oriyas, who are more in the league of chut wannabes but none of them approach the level of chutyahood perfected by the Sindhis, who are the world's most sophisticated chutes, inventors and tweakers of the Chutia's guidebook, in short, perfectionists, true masters of the genre. As for the Christians, the Anglos and Goans, chutes. As you know, unquestionably chutes, though they'll act as if the word has never left their lips or entered their brain. And the APIs and APIs, criminals to a born, criminals to a man, born criminals. You can't trust them with a pencil. Chutes. Then there are the chutes in waiting and the chutes by association, such as the Parsis and the Tribals. <laughs> now that seems like an odd chute combo, but it's not. They are exactly alike in at least one way. They act like they aren't chutes, but they are. Deep inside, they are. Chutes. The only non chutes in this entire country are Maharashtrans. I grant you, there's been some degrading of the rule in recent times, but at least with Maharashtrans, what you see is what you get islands of sanity in a sea of chutes. But even here, the only non chutia place in the whole chutia country, I challenge you to live here without turning to grade A narcotics, said Rumi leaning across the staircase to knock on the door in rapid, frustrated bursts. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for, for for that Jeet and for everyone else. Uh, Shihan mentioned um, Michael Ondaatje, who's a Sri Lankan novelist who lives in Canada. And when I moved to England at the age of you know, almost 15, and I, and, I, and I began to read, invest what was out there, improving English and what have you, there were any number of writers from our part of the world, writers who had the same skin color as me, Pukta Desai, B.S. Naipaul, any number of them going way back. But they were all, they, they were always writing about their immediate surroundings and uh, stories were generated by who they were, what their backgrounds were, where they came from, etc. Et he was this, Michael Ondaatje, he was this man who looked like me, but he wrote a book about a cowboy. Uh, he wrote a book about a jazz musician, a black jazz musician in New Orleans. And eventually he went on to write a novel about immigration, which is one of the classic books of the 20th century. 
in the skin of a lion. And, uh, but the book was not about immigration of my kind of people. It, it, it was white immigration within Canada and from Europe to Canada. Uh, it, he was talking about the same issues, but, but it is to lose your home, miss your home, make a new home, the children coming and making a new life in the new, in the new, in the new place, and you are having to tell them stories of where you came from. So they are Finnish, they are Macedonians, they are no Sri Lankans, there are no Indians, there are no Pakistanis, etc. So I always say to Anil's Ghost was the first uh, novel by, uh, I think, on, by Ondachi, which was actually set in uh, Sri Lanka. He wrote about running in the family, which was his memoir. And I always say to Ondachi that you give me the entire world, that the main thing is the, is what, the, the emotions, etc. That, that, that concern us, not what emotions concern the Pakistanis and the Indians and, and what have you. Within the, what are Pakistanis, etc., we have to look for what, what are the universal things and what you're saying, I think. And that connects with that. And second, I would like to say that the question of why writing I was, um, she was there when I was talking to about this in Sharjah, that English for me on a bad day is the language of rage. It is not my language. I should not be speaking to you in English. Why am I loving in English? Why am I dreaming in English? In that, at the age of 14, my life was broken in half and I had to leave. I, up, up, up until then, I was reading in Urdu. So my idea of literature, etc., etc., was Urdu. Great literature was Urdu in Sahar Hussain, Kola Kola Nehazar, and in fact, Faiz Ahmed Faiz, Ahmed Faraz, Isma Chukta. We then went, and I had to learn this new language due to politics, due to history, and, and what happened. And this isn't even going into how, as you mentioned, the English language came into our, our part of the world. In the first place, I'm talking about colonialism. This is all I have now. Due to circumstances, historical circumstances, I ended up being an English and a writer who writes in English. And the fact of the matter is you say that why aren't you writing in, um, uh, why aren't you writing in Urdu? The fact of the matter is given my social background, I, I'm from a, from a Mohalla in Gujranwala and a class man. Given my social background, I stayed in Pakistan, I would not be a writer. Because by the time I was 22, 23, 25, Zimitania would, would have come on me, that I would have to contribute to the family's income. So at 25 then, for me to say, like I did in England, that I am now going to sit and read everything by Faulkner, everything by Lawrence, everything by Nabokov, everything by Naipaul, everything by Hardy, everything by George Eliot, you name it. And then my mother to say, your sister has to be gotten married. We need her jahiz. And for me to say, no, 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 I'm not interested in, I, I'm going to go and be a writer. So that issue just would not have arisen in that my sister were talking about this and she almost laughed and she says, you know, it's true. You would have had to provide a dowry for me. That, and that's a fact. So let's not romanticize any of this. But, uh, we have to think of the what the ground realities are, that, that, and now you would say that you've just mentioned that all, any number of great Urdu writers, that your idea of great literature was Urdu literature, these are exceptional people. I'm not fishing for compliments, these are exceptional people. They can do it, they can manage to have their zimadariya and extra, their responsibilities, and have time for their art. I am not, I am weak. In, in, a, in a country like Britain, given its social security system, which is not Effect, people like me can do it. Uh, and, the, and I always say the worth of a society is how well it looks after the weak within it, not how well it looks after the strong that, that are in there. So uh, it's a very complicated issue, and I don't think I've given you a focused answer, but these are some of the things that went on to make me as an English writer. And, um, and I think I should now pass the mic on to you. One of the um, accusations you know, against uh, 
of uh, uh, that, that keeps coming up about legislation. Not only why do you write in English, but then when you like, um, well, uh, Shahan and Jeet and uh, Nadim have all written about uh, burning issues, uh, schisms in society. You know, um, Shahan's book deals with the uh, Sinhala Tunnel because his main character is both that conflict. Nadim about conflicts in Afghanistan within the community, uh, the divisions between extremism. Um, Jeet, uh, Jeet, well, Jeet's wonderfully funny passage was uh, the divisions within, um, within a society. You've looked at religion. And um, I, I wondered what, what kind of uh, response do you get in sub do you get a hostile response from the subcontinent and what is your answer to it? Yes? Um, well, I, I well, excuse me, one, just one before, because Moni also gets, I always find Butterfly isn't actually dealing with schisms in that way, but you also get a hostile response, don't you? Because, of, um, because Fly is flighty and not doing dynamic things you know, in that way. But not, not in that case so much. So, uh, sorry, to begin with Shahan, but I, it occurred to me that Moni also gets the response in the begin. Well, I, I don't know about a hostile response. I mean, the, the <laughs> tension was to uh, write a book that didn't deal with any of these. What I felt was a lot of Sri Lankan writing, uh, especially when coming out of Sri Lanka, there was a need to explain 50 years of misadventures and disasters in the first chapter. It was almost like giving the reader cheat notes before the story starts. And unless the writer is very skillful, it's very hard to make a history lesson entertaining and still get on with the story. So I focused on, um, I mean, okay, the stories that we hear about Sri Lanka, I mean, the sound bites are, it is a nation that has endured uh, thirst and brutality and corruption and uh, it's, in, it's in the news for, I mean, reports keep coming up to this day about that final act of the war. Or you have the travel brochure Sri Lanka, which is um, the sunny beach with these smiley people and this so-called genuine warmth and, and all of that. And just a me that there was a huge chasm, there was a spot of um, talking about characters who, um, who were neither, because I mean, despite all the depressing stuff that happens in Sri Lanka, it's not a depressing place. It is quite a cheerful, optimistic, upbeat place. So I guess I was focusing on, on trying to capture that, and I always use war and um, things that were happening historically as the backdrop and I didn't let them intrude the narrative, uh, intrude into the narrative. And I see a lot of Sri Lankan writers sort of steering away from that, um, from the heady subjects. And so I don't know if, uh, I think that was my way of sidestepping it, but also it just seemed like that was a story that wasn't being told and that's why I, I sort of got into it. Thank you. We uh, have lots of divisions in. Uh, well, the interesting thing is in terms of criticism, I think Indian poets who write in English get much more criticism than novelists for some reason. Um, and this question of writing in English as a very derogatory thing to say about somebody has been going on in India in specific um, connection with poetry for about 150 years. And it's as if, if you're writing poetry which is supposed to be genuine and from the heart, you can't, you can only do it in uh, your so-called mother tongue. But the thing is, for many of us, our mother tongues are not our mother's tongue, you know. I, uh, I think I'm of a generation of kids who can only read and write in English. It may be a loss, it may not, I don't know. But uh, that's the way it is, you know. I, you, they can speak in other languages, but they can't read and write in them. So to talk about authenticity in uh, language, in the language that you write in, I think it's a terribly insulting and reductionist kind of thing to say because language isn't cuisine. You're not talking about authentic cuisine from Lucknow, you know, or, you know, you're talking about expression and that really depends on, uh, on the writer. And I think it really is a kind of an obsolete, irrelevant question at this point, you know, uh, whether it's correct to write in English or not. Uh, I think we've realized for a very long time that English is just another one of many South Asian languages. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, well, I get uh, um, um, the, you were talking about the hostile reception. Um, when my novel, The Wasted Vigil, was published, the uh, previous one, <coughs> in which I, taking Ondachi's cue, had no Pakistani characters but brought in all the various nationalities and I put them in a, in a house to see how soon. And they were Americans, they were communists, people from the Soviet Union, that there was a, that there was a jihadi and there was somebody uh, who agreed with, disagreed with the uh, views of the militant um, uh, Islamist. And I wanted to put them in a house to see what would happen. How soon would this group of people meet and, and begin to sort of cut themselves out of these clothes that, that we wear and stand in front of each other as human beings, naked human beings, or would come into the house as naked and slowly begin to put on these clothes called nationality, politics, whatever, and then become distant and become distinct. And the traffic was both ways. Um, the book was published. I gave a reading through completely by chance within, I think, a fortnight in New York, in Lahore, and in, the, that, that, in New Delhi. In New York, after my reading, a white person stood up and said, you are a pro-jihadist. You are a closet militant Islamist. You, you approve of 9-11. You should be ashamed of yourself. Come, uh, uh, get what you read and the way you have answered. Well, okay. uh, I went to, I, I came to Lahore. After my reading, a, a young woman stood up and said, you have been paid by the CIA or the MI5 or the MI6 to write this book. You are out there to malign Pakistan and you're out there to malign Islam and, and what have you. And you should be ashamed of yourself. Um, I went to Delhi and someone stood up and said, that uh, you are a reactionary conservative, you believe in capitalism, you, you, you see no, nothing good, good in communism and the instinct that, is, that informs the politics of the left. And you should be ashamed of yourself. So exactly what I had, what, what I had attempted to do in the novel, that what, which way would the traffic be? Would we understand each other or would we actually um, become to dis ha happen in the real world. So, as Moni was saying earlier, that uh, that probably is the uh, uh, fear, and, and I actually understand what everybody was saying. The, what the person you said that it is okay that you that you want someone in Nigeria to read your book, you want someone in Canada to read your book. I think what these people are complaining about. But do you want uh, anyone in Ghana to read your book? That, that why, why isn't, or I mean, I would say that places like that are present in your book. That, I mean, you write about the whole of uh, Pakistan. It is in there, but that can be the fear. So I think then it's a conversation that you should have with these people. So that's the first thing. And second point, very quickly, I made it yesterday as well, those of you who were here. When my new book, The Blind Man's Garden, was uh, finished, I s and the and my agent and the publisher sent the manuscript out. It went, to, it went around the world, to France, to Germany, the countries in the West, and came here to India and Pakistan. This is the manuscript. And now these people have to write reports to uh, say what they thought of the book. Invariably, I can show you the reports. The response in the West was, this is a very dark book. They loved it, but it's a very dark book. And the response in India and Pakistan was, this is a very beautiful book. Now, I think th this is important in that here we weren't, we're not unaware of the problems that the darkness exists, as you, as you mentioned earlier. That uh, it's just that here we are, uh, we know that our darkness doesn't define us, that there is light in us too, that there is color in us too, and that this is what happens when... As a <laughs> so, so these are the challenges of... I'm not saying that, uh, 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 that they are wrong, or, or that uh, people here are wrong, it's just that these are the challenges which we now have to negotiate due, due 
to the globalization? Yes, uh, Moin, can you pick up on that or, or the responses to your book? Um, um, well, I have a very interesting response to. Um, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, I have a very interesting response to my last two books, which are um, which have as their narrator a very privileged but shallow um, person. Um, but nonetheless, she is a witness of our times, and she sees the world um, around her, and mm -hmm. she sees all the dangers um, that she um, has to negotiate on a daily basis. She may be an airhead, but she is a mother, and when her child goes out to school, she worries about whether th he will come home at night. Um, and so when I um, wrote this book and I went to India for a literary festival and for the launch of my book, um, I was uh, asked repeatedly by people, how do you people live? How do you cope on a daily basis? This is such a dark book. Exactly the same thing. This is such a dark book. Yes, it's funny, but it's such a dark book. And some people thought it was a hymn to the resilience of the people in Pakistan, etc. Here, when, I, when people read my book, they tell me they are entertained and they are amused and they um, love the character, they love the voice, but that they look upon it almost as light relief. So it, it, is, it, is, um, it is a little uh, strange for me that I, um, the same thing can evoke such different responses. Uh, there's just one quick question, so I'd like to open it to the floor. The quick question is, uh, you know, you've all started in different genres. Mori as a journalist <coughs> and a columnist and to novel, the Shehan as a copywriter, and then he went to the novel, and Jeet as a poet and to the novel, and Nadim actually, um, as a child, used to paint. He was telling us earlier that it was a sort of decision whether he was going to take up painting. So what, uh, or, or fiction, what, what does fiction offer you? What is the link between these genres? You can answer that very quickly because then we'll open to the floor. Begin with Moni. Um, I think um, novels have a kind of resonance that journalism doesn't. Um, they reach out to people um, and affect them in a way that um, any number of columns don't. Um, the other thing that I find which attracted me to, uh, to writing novels was that I could write it in the language that I wanted to write in. And I wanted to create my own language. I didn't want to be defined by the language. I wanted to define my own language. I wanted to write in the way that I spoke and the people around me spoke. I wanted to be able to converse with my own people in our own language. And that is what I tried to do in, in, in writing um, these last books um, and I don't think that although I did have a very I have to say a very tolerant and a very um, encouraging editor at the Friday Times who did allow me to write this column for many years in that particular language but it was only when it became a book that it became an entity in itself it, it, it was only after it became a book that people started telling me we also speak like this we also think like this um, and that is why um, I moved from um, journalism to, to writing novels. Well, yeah, my background was uh, writing advertising copy. Um, and uh, yeah, sadly, I still haven't left that. That is my day job. And um, with every advertising brief, a main component of that is target audience. Um, so you have that on every brief. So you're you're selling instant noodles, you're talking to mothers of this age coming from this place um, who don't wear a sari when they go to the market. And the thing about it is um, you have to adopt the persona. So you're talking in a voice that speaks to the target audience and you're saying stuff that you're probably not that convinced by. And, um, and you're doing it, and you're doing it um, so you move from noodles to luxury cars and... Um, uh, <laughs> It, it, it's a living, but um, you do um, lose your stomach for it after a while. And um, and I'm not saying that you don't write fiction. That I mean, I I do know there are various genres where you have strict target audience guidelines, and you have to write to that. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But I think even in genre writing, I think the best writing comes when you're writing 
to target audience which you understand or you believe in or your heart is in and usually that's a target audience that resembles yourself um, and I, th I think uh, with Chinaman that was right for a Sri Lankan reader who had grown up war and cricket and uh, watched us lose and uh, at many things on the sporting field and in politics and I, I was writing for you write a book that you would like to read and I think me that was the big of writing fiction and um, yeah, I just quit my job I think the Lahore Lit Fest has inspired me and I yeah, just uh, I I texted <laughs> I didn't have the proper guts. I kind of texted, uh, can we talk on Monday? So uh, maybe I, I might lose my nerve uh, when I go back. But um, yeah, for me, that was, I mean, you, you're still using the same muscles. You're using um, a pen and a paper to write at novels. But I think this was the key difference. It's much more fulfilling. I, I, was a, yes. I was a journalist for many years, for actually about 20 years. And uh, I had a series of absolutely horrible jobs uh, in various parts of the world uh, but the last job had to be the absolutely the worst of the lot uh, I, I worked for a newspaper in New York called India Abroad which was basically a newspaper that was full of matrimonial ads and <laughs> immigration lawyers ads and in between those ads some white space that needed to be filled and that was my job and other fools like me you know. and um, for this week for this uh, kind of uh, very significant task. We were paid a pittance and uh, I did this for four and a half years and it was very lucky in a way that it was such a bad job because I also I worked for an insane boss as many of us do and at the end of that uh, four year period I came to a point where I realized I could never again work for another person and I quit the job and came to India uh, to be a writer and r to write full time because you can't live in New York at least without a job you know so and I knew I could uh, it wouldn't be so desperate and so uh, dangerous to not have a job in India I have family in India and, um, at the time I was I published books of poems and uh, started to work on a, a book of nonfiction that eventually became a novel and realized that the point of about the novel the reason it's called a novel is because it is not it's a way of it's a very capacious form that reinvents, that can be reinvented at time. There's no rule that tells you a novel must be written like this. Or if there are rules, I was not in class that day. I was out, I was cutting class that day. <coughs> Look at Moby Dick, for instance. It breaks every rule. <coughs> you know, if that was taken to an editor or a publishing house today, he'd, th he'd, they, he'd be laughed out of the office, you know. So you can bring in things, like you can bring songs into a novel. You can poems in a novel you can have you can have jokes in a novel you can have list a, gr a list of grocery items in a novel you can really be very inventive with a novel and for me that is the beauty of the form Thank you. Yes, and, uh, um, it's interesting that both Jeet and Chiha and um, Chi, uh, and uh, Moni spoke about um, uh, what Shihan said that he wrote the book for a Sri Lankan um, audience in mind. And what is amazing to me is that it connects with this, with this Pakistani from England, as it were, or, or this Englishman from Pakistan, as it were. And it, and it connects with people in America. And that is the power of what a novel can do. This is why fiction is important. And to, to link with, the, with your question, what you were saying, that uh, I began as a, as a child, I used to paint, and I still paint. Uh, and it does inform my work, I think. I mean, I, I get as much pleasure from looking at an apple as from eating it. Um, so I look at pictures every day, I think almost uh, every day, and, and I use them then, and I use them personally. As per. There's a painting by Behzad, uh, um, the great uh, miniaturist, um, where, uh, which illustrates a moment in the Quran rooms. And she actually took him from room to room, and the top one was 
the bedroom and she actually, eventually there she tried to dress him. And the picture is seven rooms with the stairs moving from one to the other. And the top one, we see her trying to grab hold of, her, uh, of his coat and he's running away. And yeah. I, yes. Yes. Um, is he okay? Yeah. Okay. And uh, so, so I, um, uh, I took that as the, as the beginning point of my last novel, *The Wasted Vigil*. In which there is a house which a man, a man, a man builds, and uh, this uh, with um, the Behzad painting was this. Uh, a negative thing in that she was trying to sort of assault him in a way, uh, but but I turned it into a love story. So it's a it's a house with five rooms, and the top one is painted golden. And this man wishes to marry this woman, and he brings her into the first room where he tells a story. So and each of those five rooms are dedicated to one of the senses, and the and the and the walls are painted with the frescoes to do with that sense. And so in the first room, which is dedicated to, let's say, taste, there are pictures about taste, and he tells her stories. So then they move on to the next one, which is hearing. So then he tells her stories about hearing. Then we move on to touch. Then we move, so, and slowly, and eventually the, there is a top room, which is the golden room. And that is where she says, yes, I will marry you. And that comes directly out of painting. Uh, uh, that would not have existed had I not known uh, pictures, and uh, I hope that answers your question. So, so yes, I use it every day. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, we have a little time for questions. Uh, any questions? Oh, there's a question here. Is it this? Um, Nadim, you mentioned that if you had stayed on in Pakistan, you wouldn't have a book. You wouldn't have become a writer because of responsibilities, getting a jays for your sister. I'm sure now my sister is very powered like all of us and doesn't need a jays. But well, forgive me. Go on. No, no, no. no, please go on. But the thing is that this links in with um, my most recent novel, The Blind Man, Garden, in which I have a work class girl from a mohalla. And, and I wanted to show her growth, as it were. She, towards the end of the novel, basically becomes a really confident woman, and she actually takes over the entire house. No, and not take, takes over the, she actually, the responsibility for the entire household is on her. She's, she's lo looking after everyone in the house, so much so that when her lover says, what if I asked you to come away with me? And she says, I can't, because they need me. Baba needs me, Mama needs me, I, I need to look after. So. Now, given her social circumstances and the mohalla and etc., where she's from, I couldn't, I couldn't have shown her triumph as becoming the chief executive of an international firm. Her triumph is really that she is now looking after the house and she is now um, uh, enrolled in a teacher training course. Right. Her triumph would be so. It's, so it's baby steps. So um, I can also imagine what my sister's life would be here, sure. frankly. Yes. So, uh, but so th there is progress, but we have to understand that still it is within certain limitations, and it, and it probably is a generational thing. Patiently, slowly, her children would be different, and their children would be different. And empowerment, relative. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. So, going on, would you now write a book? Can, can, sorry, can we get somebody else? I'm, I'm, I'm finishing my question. Okay. Would you now write a book to match um, the audience? May, perhaps in Urdu, and to match the audience of, a mohal, of people living in a Mohalla and Gujarwala. Uh, exactly, uh, I am impaled onto my biography. 
I can't. I read Urdu, but I'm, I'm, I'm quite an obsessive human being. I would want to know English, Urdu language as well as I think I know English. So I think that for me it will be difficult because I would not, I now live in England, I now visit here and I always say for me to now try to write in Urdu would be trying to swim in an empty swimming pool. There is no thing that holds me up. Language is if you are like Jeet and like Shehan and like Muni as, and especially all three of us have mentioned that it's a, it's a malleable new thing and every time you're, you're making that. So for me it is the language of the advertising. It's, 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 the, it's the mistakes a child makes when he's learning to language. So instead of saying butterfly, he says a uh, flutterbug. Or so, and that is actually what you make your books with. And for me, now that language is English. Exactly. Just behind you. Um, I have a couple of questions, uh, general questions for the panel. Coming from South Asia and writing in English, is this almost imperative that you have to derive your inspiration from hunger and grief and anger and disappointment? Or do you find an inspiration in something more positive? And a very small question from, for, for Nadeem. Um, how does one get into the mind of a jihadi? How does one um, breach the territories that is filled with line mi la landmines and how does one end how does one find a happy ending at, at the end thank you so much i'm going to let everyone else speak i've spoken too much so. <laughs> no 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 well, one of you i think that, 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 that you know I mean, I'd like to think I wrote a cheerful little story, but um, yeah, at the heart of it is failure. And uh, looking at the new book, which has nothing to do with the subject, but I think that is the theme, and I think that is the theme of Sri Lanka, um, unfulfilled potential, we failing to capitalize on winning the World Cup in 96, uh, winning the war uh, in 2009. Um, yeah, some, some always sporting events and events of human uh, tragedy seem to be apparent to me. Um, I think, I mean, the sense of uh, writing and drama is conflict, and therefore it, it does come from these places. So, um, yeah, I, I guess we can't help it. In, in India, at least, uh, you know, there's a whole kind of a triumphalism in India that's been happening over the last five or seven years, where there's this idea put out by the government, of course, and the government's advertising machine that India is shining and is growing and is becoming <coughs> and, uh, you know, and all of these are advertising lies. No, no offense against the advertising no, I'm community. I've, I've quit, <laughs> man. I'm done with that. <laughs> but, you know, ad, I've, I've been a copywriter for a, a year, a year now, and the whole point about advertising copy is the better you tell your lies, the more you're paid. And this was the great lie that was put about in India for a couple of years, that India is finally a great economic power. It might be for, for the big businessmen and who run those businesses, but for 80 or 90 percent of the people out of the cities, it ha nothing has changed in about 200 years, you know, so, uh, and uh, nothing is going to change at least in my lifetime, that's very clear. So if you are writing a book about India and you are, and it's a happy life kind of book, I mean it's fine to do that, but I don't think you're going to be able to reflect the reality of that country. And as a character in Narcopolis says, uh, the only way to deal with the horror of an Indian city, the kind of horror that you deal with on a daily basis, is with the grotesque and with a, a returning kind of horror. Moni, do you want to take that? I would just say that, you know, as Nadim was saying, you have to be supported. You have, it's been like in a swimming pool. Um, you, you swim in that particular medium. You swim in that atmosphere and that environment. You have to write about that environment and that atmosphere. Um, I try, 
I, but I do try to infuse my books with a little bit of, um, as, as Nadeem's called them, the, the small triumphs. The fact that you got home from school today. That the fact that um, you were stopped on the road and a gun was put to your head, but that they didn't fire it. Um, that is a victory. There's a victory in the fact that your maid has left, it's a victory for her, that she's left your employment and gone to get a job in Dubai, um, to a better job. Um, that is a triumph. It is a triumph that a woman who has never worked, feels deeply unfulfilled, starts a catering company and becomes a success. That is also a triumph. And so, you know, your work, you, you take, as I said, you know, in, in life, you take one step forward, two steps backward, sometimes sideways, sometimes the other side. Um, and that is what fiction also shows, I think, and that's what I, I try and show. So, Nadeem, yes, you, you must answer how you get into the mind of a jihad. Yes, about poverty, but also how you get into the mind of a jihad. Well, very quickly, I mean, the answer is imaginative sympathy. You, you go and talk to these people, and then you read about these things. I mean, whatever I am, fine, if I'm writing about a Pakistani, whatever I am, I am not a 60-year-old Pakistani man. But you can write about it. I am not a... Uh, uh, um, and this links in with what I was saying about earlier. Ondachi giving me, me the permission to write about Russians. And uh, uh, so, I mean, I'm not saying that, hey, we have this bourgeois individual who thinks he can go into anyone's history, anyone's politics, anyone's country stories, anyone's fairy tales and think, I'm going to pick and choose these things. No one enters other people's stories, and including the stories of the jihadis, um, with respect and trying to understand them. And, uh, and then you think, if I make a mistake, please understand that, I underst uh, that this is coming from a good place and let me know if I make a mistake. So imaginative sympathy is the main thing. And uh, what, was the other, uh, what was the other question? Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, you say one quick question. They're all coming. Oh, there's one here, is there? Uh, sorry, that one last question. Uh, this is for uh, Moni and Nadeem. I'm just going to read this piece of paper. Please uh, bear with me. Um, don't you feel that South Asian writers occasionally tend to succumb to the idea of representing Pakistan or India accurately by pigeonholing their own pot potential. Also, I wanted to ask that isn't this also a very disingenuous way of pandering to the West by perhaps romanticizing South Asia or um, creating or enforcing South Asian literary stereotypes? Uh, one was romanticizing South Asian. What was the first half? The first half was basically pigeonholing one's own potential by wanting to represent Pakistan accurately or India accurately to the world. Well, representing, I think. And, and don't forget pandering to the West. Pandering yes. to the West. Okay. Yes. I mean, you know, <laughs> to I, I've never heard that phrase before. <laughs> <laughs> well, true story. Did you, you take <laughs> the invitation? No, I no. no. Please. <laughs> Up, yes. I don't know. I think we're going to be presented with that. And in a, in a way, we've been talking about this the entire session, one way or the other. This is what we've been... And I think your question has been answered. In that, uh, me referring to Andachi and etc., etc., and I can't really... I, I have no answer. Whether I'm pandering to, to the West, I keep saying... This, Have, have we got time for questions? No. Okay, that my time is up, sadly. Thank you very much, and um, thank you very much to my wonderful panel. Thank you. It's more paperback.